Thank you all for joining and welcome to Riyadh. So basically, um, I will start with, um, just for the sake of time, uh, I have to declare that we have such esteemed speakers and uh, panelists with us, um, expert in the field of research development. Um, their CVs is quite heavy, but I'll try to summarize them in just a few uh, sentences you know, for the sake of time. So Professor Mazen Hassanin, we're going to start with you. Um, and um, Professor Mazen is a highly esteemed surgeon and the manager, director, and co-founder of Sadivax, which is a biotechnology company that is focused on the development of high quali uh, quality and affordable vaccines and biopharmaceutical localized in Saudi Arabia. Um, so Dr. Hassanin will share, will share with us the current effort and activities at Sadivax and how would this program will support the, the ambition of our nation's uh, vision in vaccine development? Floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this working? Yeah. So thank you very much uh, for, uh, for the invitation. This is a real pleasure to be here with, uh, with the amazing STEAM uh, panelists. Uh, the, the, uh, we're, we're a typical biotech uh, company. We started uh, licensing few intellectual properties in vaccines developments and biopharmaceuticals, um, uh, mostly from academia, uh, both uh, national and international. Um, the beginning uh, was uh, hoping to go through rounds of funds to okay. develop the products. Uh, initially, we really outsourced a lot of the activities to CROs, mostly in North America. Okay. Uh, now with time, we're trying to uh, localize some of that uh, development in, in the kingdom. Okay. So uh, we worked closely with our, since our uh, presence in Jeddah, we worked closely with both uh, King Abdelaziz <coughs> University and KAUST. Uh, we benefited from uh, both the protein uh, analysis capability at the core facility lab and also uh, from the process development lab and uh, testing at King Abdelaziz University. We uh, uh, recently successfully establishing a, uh, the actual, the first process development lab uh, that's industry scale uh, at the King Abdelaziz University, something that is we're proud of and should be finalized by end of November next oh, month. Nice. Okay. Um, and this is for the first time where we can actually take a small scale research material, try to scale it up uh, because one of, one of the major obstacles in uh, commercialization is scalability yes. of the products. Uh, we do uh, some in vitro testing, some animal testing in-house, also mostly in collaboration with also the uh, animal house at the university. But we also outsource to other CROs, especially when it comes to PK and PD uh, analysis uh, in North America. Hopefully with time we'll, uh, we'll localize that too. Um, and at the same time, in parallel, we're establishing our own manufacturing facility to do uh, an actual GMP manufacturing. Right. It's a lot of work. Good news to hear that Saudi Vax is uh, becoming more active in, in vaccine development. Um, we are looking forward to seeing the, uh, the output soon. Right, and we think this is the real way and path to, uh, Excellent. to give uh, national security and localization. Thank you, Dr. Mazin, for your insights. And um, moving to our next panelist, with Professor Green. Catherine Green is the uh, head of clinical biomanuf biomanufacturing faculty at uh, the University of Oxford. Her team supports academic and clinicians to translate innovation to clinical use. She has been uh, manufacturing vaccines um, and aiming to prevent many global diseases, many viruses uh, not limited to malaria, TB, Zika, MERS, etc. It's a very long list, of Professor. <laughs> um, and she was among the she was among the first um, team to develop, develop the first batch of AstraZeneca vaccine. Thank you very much, uh, the, uh, Professor Green, for being with us. And um, for, for, your in, uh, for your insight, I really want to know how the academic would help in, in the vaccine development and how would they um, facilitate the partnership with the private sector? If you can share with us any success stories or so. Yeah, I think, it's, I think we have a unique mm. role to play, academia, mm. in yeah. vaccine development, partly because there are challenges in the yeah. pharmaceutical model for vaccine delivery when the expectation is that you can manufacture vaccines for a dollar a dose. Um, and that's a challenge for anybody that's, that's coming into this sector. So I think there is space for academia to de-risk projects, for innovation to come out from the great resources we have in universities such as in the UK or here in Saudi Arabia, and to 
translate those for the first time within academia, demonstrate they have the potential to be successful, and then they can get taken on perhaps by a, by a biotech or a spin out or a large pharma company. And that's what we did with AstraZeneca for the COVID vaccine, but is also what we've done for other vaccines. So our malaria vaccine started in Oxford and then now is being manufactured in Serum Institute India and is being deployed via WHO programs across Africa now. But also our programs for Zika, for chikungunya, for plague, for MERS, start in academia, prove that they work, and then hopefully we find ways to get them out to the world with mm. private sector investment. We know that vaccines have to cross borders, yeah? Pandemics are by their nature, international, and universities are very good at encouraging Absolutely. global collaboration. 50% of the graduate students at Oxford University are not from the UK. So we bring the talent in and we train them up and then send them back out into the world. That starts these networks of collaboration, which then I think we proved during the pandemic International collaboration is everything. AstraZeneca demonstrated to get global equity of vaccine delivery, you need to manufacture on multiple continents in multiple places to prevent the risk of vaccine nationalism and vaccines being stuck within borders when pandemics are crossing them. I think academia can play a good role getting started with that process, and then we have to, at some point, hand over to the private sector for delivery and deployment. I absolutely agree with you, Professor. It's actually uh, science has no borders. And yeah. I think I think we all play a very vital role uh, and we need to collaborate. And one of the great examples that uh, I've seen in your leadership is the Vax Hub. So Vax Hub is a kind of network bringing academia and uh, the private sector. Uh, we would love to see this more to be expanded at a global level. That's right. So the UK government recognizes that this is an initiative. Mm -hmm. And so the UK government via our via funding schemes in the UK, set up networks of UK manufacturers that have to team up with manufacturers in low and middle income countries and with academics across the world to try and support innovation in vaccine manufacturing that then we can get better vaccines and better vaccine technologies and training of the skilled workforce that you need across the globe in order to be able to deliver manufacturing globally. So the UK government understands. I know that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia understands that the vaccine technologies have to be globalised in order to be effective. Looking forward for our partnership and thank you very much, Professor. And moving on to our next two speakers are from CEPI, which is um, they are, uh, the uh, global entity to fund and support vaccine development. Uh, so uh, we'll start with uh, Matthew, Dr. Matthew Dunham. He's a biochemical engineer with 25 years of experience in vaccine and biopharma industry working on therapies for infectious disease, hypertension, inflammatory, and oncology. Uh, and, oncology. and in, recently, in January 21, he joined CEPI and is currently the director of manufacturing and supply chain networks. Um, so Dr. Denham will share with us how CEPI can build this multi-sectoral uh, opportunities of partnership. Um, and you could help us guide us um, with the current situation here uh, in the MENA region. No, thank you very much indeed. And Dr. Maha, thank you for that kind introduction. And of course, to the organizers uh, for inviting uh, CEPI and myself and Samia to speak today. Um, CEPI, as just mentioned, is a coalition of epidemic preparedness innovations. Um, it, is a, it is a multilateral partnership that's funded by many organizations, many member states, including the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, for which we're immensely grateful. Uh, and we're stood up specifically, as just mentioned, to think about research and development uh, in key pathogens and key areas. Um, one of the areas that CEPI's worked on is COVID. I won't speak too much to that because Sammy is going to speak more on that shortly. But one of the lessons learned from COVID was that the urgency really moving forwards is to geodiversify vaccine manufacturing, to ensure that vaccine manufacturing is occurring in regions and locations largely underserved let's say in global south or low middle income countries. And this facilitates not just the agile supply of vaccines within those regions, but the vaccine uptake as well. There's less hesitancy and less reluctance as it were to use those vaccines. So what CEPI has done uh, to facilitate this to ensure epidemic and pandemic preparedness moving forwards is we have stood up a vaccine manufacturing facility network. And we've done this specifically against the target network profile, considering the capacities, considering the location, considering the aspirations, considering the established maturity of the organizations that we've collaborated and funded moving forwards. To date, we have five facilities globally. Uh, the first was Aspen in South Africa. 
We have Institute Pasteur Dakar in Dakar, in Senegal. Uh, we have Biopharma in Indonesia, Serum Institute of India in India, and most recently announced at the Global Pandemic Preparedness Summit in Brazil, uh, the Fear Cruz B. Manguinos organization. And the scope within each of these organizations is to geodiversify, to improve their capacity and capability, whether they want to embed mRNA vaccine processes or viral vector pr vaccine processes. So we are funding, we are supporting, we're implementing those as well as quality management systems to facilitate these uh, moving forwards. And this is the kind of key thrust, the key idea of the vaccine manufacturing facility network. As you may imagine, it's like dropping a stone into a pond. That's the initial ripple. There are other ripples that go with that. We're working very closely with a range of partners. The Gates Foundation, of course, is not only a funder of CEPI from a philanthropy perspective, uh, but we're also closely collaborating with Aspen. We are jointly funding Aspen to be able to fill finish vaccines to supply uh, to Africa. We're working with the, Institute, uh, with the IFC, the Division of the World Bank, the International uh, uh, Division of the World Bank, to support their particular strategy, their particular areas of engagement for vaccine manufacturing. We're working with the WHO. We hosted a, a regional organizational uh, meeting for the Eastern Mediterranean region on vaccine manufacturing, the landscape and what's needed to support vaccines uh, and supply within the Eastern Mediterranean region. And we, of course, work uh, very closely with the WHO Medicines Patent Pool because three of the organizations that we are funding and supporting are indeed mRNA uh, WHO MPP facilities in their own right. So this is an example of areas that we are collaborating and working together. Dr. Kaseya, just shortly before, has kindly referenced CEPI in his re uh, presentation regarding Africa CDC, with whom we are also closely working to think about not so much the vaccine manufacturing, but the supply of critical consumables, raw materials, to support vaccine manufacturing in Africa as it expands its footprint to supply 60% of the vaccines for the region from within the region. So there's an incredible aspiration there. So just to try and summarize, we are trying to pursue facilitating improved agile response to epidemics and pandemics moving forward, particularly in the global south, the underserved regions, a lesson learned from COVID, and through that improve the public health security and the availability of vaccines, equitable access to vaccines, particularly to pathogens endemic within these regions. Lassa fever, for example, in the region of uh, West Africa, out of the facility IPD in Senegal moving forwards. That's the ultimate aspiration of the tech transfer that we're working on there. And with that, maybe I will pause. Yeah. And thank you, Dr. Mahath. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. Um, very insightful. Thank you very much. And I think we're looking forward to seeing the partnership of CEPI with um, uh, the MENA region um, in the production of... Actually, the, the COVID, we've learned a lot. We learned that um, multi-central partnership accelerated the vaccine development. We saw how the COVID vaccine was developed within six months because people got together. So we, we hope to see this more often. Mm -hmm. okay. And we'll move on to our last and final uh, speaker is Dr. Samia, also from CEPI. Dr. Samia Saeed is a biomedical scientist who has the last three decades has led the research and policy engagement in pharma, uh, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical R&D and innovation with a focus on access to vaccine, therapeutics, and diagnosis for global health. Samia is currently senior advisor to the CEO and has been involved with CEPI since the founding of 2017. Welcome, Dr. Samia. So um, Dr. Samia is going to uh, share with us um, how CEPI can uh, create global partnership opportunities for vaccine development, and especially again uh, here in this region. Thank you, Dr. Ramaha, for the invitation. Really exciting to be here and see all the energy, especially uh, there's a focus as well on innovation at the Global Health exhibition here in, in, in Riyadh. So delighted to be here. Just picking up a little bit on the, the title of multi-center partnerships. And I think that the key lesson we learned from COVID is, as colleagues have said on the panel, is you need to have capacities in every region in the world. And building networks that are connected, that can do knowledge and, and, and technology transfer amongst them is really important. And during COVID, one of the, the key important things that CEPI fostered was to build a central lab network mm -hmm. around the world. And now we have partners in every continent, at least one in every continent around the world. And the aim of that was to try and create some standardized and harmonized tools and assays 
to be to that were accessible to any researcher in the world that was working on developing COVID vaccines, because the, the point here was to try and make sure we had same tools to assess different vaccines and how they were creating an immune response and, and comparing them. Um, and, and building on that from the COVID experience, this lab network is now established and it tries to create assays and tools for vaccine developers across a whole range of emerging infectious diseases. So that's a legacy, an important legacy. Um, now, what was also really important in terms of multi-partners multi during the COVID response was that um, it became very clear that we needed to have an end-to-end -end view um, and capacity and bringing partners that had experience across the value chain of, co of vaccine development together to look at how do we incentivize the R&D and de-risk it by creating a pooled fund, which was CEPI, to try and, and, and create a portfolio of vaccines. But at the same time, we needed to have people that were thinking about the procurement and, and, and making sure we understood the supply and the needs. And then that was Gavi, our partner. Um, and then we, of course, needed the WHO there as a normative body that was saying, okay, in this, we didn't have billions of vaccines at the beginning, and we needed to take time to scale up some of these new platforms. Um, uh, we needed an allocation mechanism based on the highest need, highest burden, so healthcare workers in the front line, over 65s, people with, vulnerable, with, with uh, pre-existing conditions had to get those first. And then, of course, we had UNICEF um, there who had expertise on delivering vaccines on the ground from their routine uh, immunization programs. So bringing those partners together and working together was critical, really, to try and make sure that we got, in the end, uh, over 2 billion doses out everywhere around the world that really needed them. And that there was some equity. It, it didn't happen as fast as it, would, it could have done. And that was in part because, unfortunately, some of the high-income countries had already purchased that limited vaccine manufacturing capacity. So clearly, the vaccine manufacturing capacity around the world wasn't there. And so this, these ideas now, um, Professor Green, Matthew's team, trying to create those capacities, manufacturing capacities, inshallah, as well in, in, the, in the MENA and, and Gulf region, um, is really important so that we can fight any future outbreaks closer to where the outbreaks are happening. Absolutely. And then last quick thing, again, the power of networks. So beyond, again, when we look at vaccine development, and I know Saudi Arabia has an ambition to really look at it from an end-to-end -end, uh, view, from innovation, from surveillance, pathogen sequencing, etc., the clinical trials to the manufacturing pieces. What's really important is to have a network of partners that you can match make with different institutes around the world and have access to, as I said, some of these assays and tools. So everything that CEPI does is really to create these networks that create some global goods um, and facilitate tech transfer, joint ventures, etc. So that is the power of multi-center partnerships in CEPI's experience. Uh, appreciate it and well said. Thank you, doctor. Um, honestly, putting add into this, uh, it, I would love you guys to attend tomorrow's panel, which is basically it will describe the challenges of um, infectious disease within the region and how the powerful uh, network and, and the uh, collaboration can solve these uh, outbreaks and predict these outbreaks before they happen. So um, I totally agree with you. Thank you very much. So. Um, I think in closing, um, we're in good in time, that's good. Uh, I will leave it to you guys, um, if you wanna share just one more recommendation at the end, uh, any powerful statement or like a next step that should be done. We'll start with ladies first then, Professor Green. <laughs> okay, so I think the um, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's health minister this morning said three things wanna come out of this conference innovation, collaboration, and action. Excellent. And for me, I think it's the action there that's important. Yes. We have innovation, you have innovation in the kingdom. Yes. You have collaboration, but we need to act. You can't not act now because it seems like a cost now to act. But if a pandemic comes, that cost is a saving. Pandemic preparedness 
delivers new vaccines now for diseases that we already know of, mm -hmm. so you get those, and readiness for a new threat when it emerges. So it's like a win-win situation. Absolutely. So we need to act now. Absolutely. And I think this is the role of RDIA comes in to support uh, the research and innovation and development. Thank you. And Dr. Samia. Um, maybe it's a similar theme in terms of acting, but it is about preparedness, that you make investments in innovation and you make investments in having people practice on the new vaccine platforms like our mRNA or vector-based um, uh, platforms that came, that were validated and, uh, during COVID. And they have to practice on, um, on maybe some of the childhood vaccines, um, uh, diseases that we know, um, in order that if a new pathogen does come up or a Marburg shows up in Rwanda for the first time, that, that there are capacities on the ground, We're ready. including the enabling capacities. Yeah. So the regulators need to be exposed to sort of how these platforms work so that when new, new pathogens or disease X, which was our COVID, um, uh, comes up, they can quickly sort of assess data and help the scientists move forward, right? And, and design clinical trials that are fit for purpose and can accelerate in a safe way without compromising safety. So preparedness investments in innovation, in regulatory science, in manufacturing innovations as well, that is really key if we want to be able to, to really stem future COVID outbreaks. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Mazen, would you like to add something? Sure, sure. I think um, I, give, I give, bring the prospectus of the private sector. And I think if we go back to the COVID-19 uh, story, we see a lot of risk uh, sharing. And I think that's a big mm -hmm. component yeah. that is not, it's, it's within the context of partnership, but it's really from a private sector and from an investment opportunity mm -hmm. is a risk sharing because most of the successful vaccines that made it through, there was um, risk sharing at the time of innovation there was risk sharing at time of uh, research development and there was risk sharing uh, at the commercialization with, the, with advanced purchase, both from Gavi, SAPI or from governments. So I think that risk sharing has been tremendously important to, to push the pendulum very quickly because from a private sector perspective, they would like, especially in early development, they would like to support and help the, the, uh, the pandemic preparedness, but at the end of the day, it needs to make sense from a financial perspective. So. I think that that is a, also a model that needs to be established. We need to find this the right balance between yeah. the two, yes. Absolutely agree. Thank you, Professor. Dr. Matthew? Thank you. No, I think some of the key messages have been said, but I think really to be prepared for any future epidemics or pandemics, and it's not if they'll occur, it's when they'll occur, they will occur. Um, pandemic flu or many other diseases. Dr. Kassair has shared on some of yeah. what's happened in Africa right at this time. To be prepared for future epidemics and pandemics requires acting today. And that requires playing together with a multitude of partners, whether it's industry, academia, whether it's suppliers, governments, philanthropies, investors. It requires that, uh, that, that accumulation of organizations working together as we saw through the COVID pandemic. Um, so I'm going to leave with a kind of a famous kind of phrase. There's two times to plant a tree. Absolutely. The first is today, and the second time was 20 years ago. We need to work to think today to plant the tree so that we are ready for epidemics Absolutely. and pandemics in the future. And that's the kind of adage that I would kind of leave with. Okay, thank great. You. Thank you. I will close as well. Um, for me, I would uh, definitely voice out uh, your recommendation. Uh, I agree that we have to... Uh, start planning, strategizing this initiative as soon as possible, because this is like a, uh, not only a threat for the country, but at a global level. Um, the the hop vax that you have done, I think it's, it's going to be a great example that we can uh, mirror here. And, and we're already negotiating how we can develop this, right? We're, we're going to take it further. Thank you very much for your time and for a great panel. And uh, welcome to Riyadh. I hope you enjoy your evening and your Thank stay you. in Riyadh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.